Yeah, it's good to see Jocelyn uh, here this morning, sitting third row from the front. 22 years ago today, uh, the Lord uh, blessed us with uh, our fourth and final uh, addition to the family. Uh, Blair, I know we don't usually do this, but uh, she'll yell at me if I don't, so uh, or maybe she'll yell at me for doing it, but well, let's uh, sing her happy birthday. I'm not sure what way that's going to go down after, I'll find out later, but uh, in any event, great to see you all this morning. Grace? Yeah, Angela's on Wednesday. <laughs> yes, Angela's birthday is this Wednesday as well. Grace, uh, Angela will appreciate you uh, pointing that out. Uh, 20, 24. 24. That's right, Justin's 22, Angela's 24. See, Grace, see what you've done, Grace? I received a surprising email a couple of weeks ago, uh, Sunday afternoon, two weeks ago, right after church. I received this email from a friend uh, in which he said, Roy, I heard a rumor that you have passed away. Uh, please confirm. I wasn't sure how on earth I was supposed to confirm if indeed that rumor had been true. But when you hear a rumor, uh, you want to establish whether indeed it is true, don't you? In fact, when you want to establish the facts of an event, um, you want to interview the eyewitnesses, if there are any. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you experience? And then you cross-reference those testimonies to see if they collaborate or contradict each other. That's the way our court system is set up. And that's exactly what John does in the opening chapter of his wonderful little gospel. He records seven eyewitness testimonies who testify to the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So turn to John chapter 1 again. We're carrying on in this wonderful book study in the Gospel of John of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to pick up now the next section at verse 35. And here's how John begins verse 35. The next day. Well, let's stop there for a second because that's the second time John has used that phrase. In verse 29, he said the next day. In fact, he's going to say it again the third time in verse 43. The next day. So John chapter 1 records a series of events that take place over a four-day period. If you say the next day three times over, that means you're talking about four days' worth of events. And to be even more precise, within one of those days, in verse 39, if you look, John even supplies a time frame. Verse 39, he says it was about the tenth hour. Now, if he's referring to Roman time, that means that it was 10 o'clock in the morning. And we can't be sure whether he's referring to Roman time or Jewish time. If he's referring to Jewish time, which begins at 6 a.m. in the morning, that means it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It doesn't really matter what time it is. The point is that John is being very precise with his account of days and times. As a matter of fact, you see this all through John's account of this gospel, of the events specifically around the crucifixion. In John chapter 12, John records six days before the Passover, because the timing of the Passover was absolutely critical to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. In chapter 12, verse 12, John says again, the next day. And then on crucifixion day, John gives regular time updates when different events of the crucifixion were taking place at the third hour, at the sixth hour, etc., and so on and so forth. Now, why is that? 
Because precision speaks of credibility. That's the whole purpose of John's book. To convince his readers that this is not a fable. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a fabrication. This is historical fact. In John chapter 20, verse 31, John expressly states the reason why John wrote the book. He says, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. John is saying here, the stakes here are eternal. Your eternal soul is hanging in the balance of whether all of this is true or not. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the entire world and loses his own soul? The stakes are higher than all the money that you have made over your entire life. The stakes are higher than the equity in your home. The stakes here are higher than the combined value of all of the cars that you've driven over the course of your life. John is saying here, the information that I'm giving you here is all true. I'm not making this up. And he's giving you accurate, precise details with times and days. That's the idea. John chapter 1. So in this first chapter of the book, he's going to establish the truth of all of this. By giving us the names or the identities of six, or sorry, of seven eyewitnesses who are going to testify to the reality and to the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what a great way to begin a book. I mean, if you want to establish that something is true, that what you're writing in this book is true, what a great way to begin with seven eyewitness accounts of seven people who report what they saw, what they heard, and what they experienced to prove that it's all real. So, let's look at those testimonies right now. Those seven eyewitness testimonies. Back to verse 35. <clears throat> the next day, John, well that's John the Baptist. Don't confuse John the Baptist with John the Apostle, the author of the book. John never refers to himself by name in his book. So anytime you see the, the, the name John, it's never referring to John the Apostle, the writer of the Gospel. John does not refer to himself by name in the book. John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples and Jesus walked past. And John looked at Jesus as he walked past, pointed at him, and said, Behold the Lamb of God. There's John the Apostle's first eyewitness testimony. John the Baptist testifying that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Now, why does he call him the Lamb of God? What's the significance of that? Well, that's a reference to the Old Testament Passover lamb. Everybody has heard of the Jewish Passover holiday. The Jewish Passover commemorates the Israelite exodus out of Egypt when the Hebrew people were told by Moses, who was told by God, to take a lamb, one year old, that is without spot, without blemish, and slaughter it. And don't break its bones. And take its blood and spill its blood over the doorway, the lintel, and down the sides of the door of every Hebrew home in the land of Egypt. Because the angel of death is going to cover over Egypt and spray death over every home in Egypt that does not have the blood on the door and the firstborn child in every home is going to die in one night. And the Israelites slaughtered thousands of little lambs in one day. And for the next 1500 years, with some breaks when the Israelites were exiled out of the land, every year the Israelites slaughtered thousands of lambs 
at the same time at Passover to commemorate the night the angel of death passed over. That's what Passover means. But it passed over Egypt. And amazingly, 1,500 years later, Jesus was executed at Passover. On the very day that thousands of Passover lambs were being slaughtered in Jerusalem, in the temple, well, that's some kind of a coincidence. Especially when Mark chapter 14 says that when the murderers were plotting and conspiring, they said, let's wait until after Passover before we kill him because there's too many people in town and there'll be too much chaos. And yet, <coughs> Jesus was killed at the precise moment when his executioners planned not to kill him. Because Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 18, nobody can take my life away from me. I sacrifice my life voluntarily. I have the authority to lay down my life when I want to. And I have authority to take it up again when I want to. Nobody else in history has been able to say that. Nobody can ever determine the exact moment of their own birth. Yet Jesus did. Nobody has been able to avoid death when it was their time. When Jesus' enemies tried to kill Jesus before his time, which they did try to do, you see that recorded in the Gospels, they couldn't kill him because it wasn't his time. And when it was time, they could not not kill him, even though they didn't want to kill him. Jesus was killed only because he allowed them to kill him. And he died at precisely the hour when the Passover lambs were being killed in Jerusalem, in the temple. Nobody else in history has been in control of their own death the way Jesus was. And interestingly, Passover lambs were being slaughtered for 1,500 years from the time of Moses all the way up to 70 AD, 40 years after Jesus died, when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed and wiped out by the Roman armies because the Passover lamb was no longer necessary. So here's our first witness. John the Baptist calls him the Lamb of God. John the Baptist would say, I saw him, I heard him, I investigated him, I examined him, and I know for a certainty he is the Lamb of God. So there's our first witness. Now let's meet our second eyewitness. Actually, there's two of them. One is named and one is unnamed. Look at verse 35. <coughs> John was standing, it's John the Baptist, of course, was standing with two of his disciples. We know that one of the two disciples was Andrew. That's very clear because if you drop down to verse 40, it says one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew. There's his name right there. Simon Peter's brother. The other one was John, the author of the book, the unnamed one. And we know that by the process of elimination, as you'll see in a moment. Look at verse 37. The two disciples heard John say this, Behold the Lamb of God. And they followed Jesus. Now, keep in mind, this is not their conversion. This is very likely the first time they've laid eyes on Jesus. But they're intrigued by John's testimony <coughs> that Jesus is the personification of the Passover lamb. And they follow Jesus. But why do they follow him? Well, because they want to know more. They've got a hundred questions. You can imagine, can't you? John the Baptist has given his testimony. There's the Lamb of God. But now these two fellows have got a thousand questions. And so they go up to Jesus. Look at verse 38. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? In other words, what do you want? It's a very simple question. In other words, how can I help you? It's just a normal question asked of anybody who seems to be looking for something. If someone walked up to you and they're following you, that would be a natural question for you to turn around and say, What do you want? And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. What do you want? 
And they said to him, Rabbi, that's a good start. That's a recognition that Jesus is at least a scholarly person. He's a teacher. He's someone who knows something. There's, there's an initial respect. That's a very good beginning. Rabbi, where are you staying? <coughs> That causes some people a little bit of confusion. What on earth would they ask that question for? Where are you staying? Now, why on earth do they want to know where he's staying? Well, it's very simple. Because they've got a hundred questions. And John the Baptist's testimony has intrigued them. And they're just like a lot of people who first hear about Jesus, who first encounter Jesus. A friend tells them about Jesus Christ and it's the first time they've ever heard of him. And they develop a curiosity, an intrigue, a, a thirst to discover more. And they have all these questions. And so they've bumped into Jesus in the street. And there's lots of people around, undoubtedly. And Jesus is a very busy person. He's a rabbi. And they're saying to Jesus, we need to talk. I mean, we've got a hundred questions we need to ask you. But you're so busy right now. We don't want to interfere with you. We don't want to interrupt you. Where are you staying? We'll come by later and meet you later when we can sit down and have a chat and we can ask you all of our questions and you can fill us in. That's all it means. Where are you staying? Our questions are not going to get answered in a two-minute soundbite. And look at the marvelous answer of Jesus, verse 39. Come and you will see. Amazing. Jesus just stops whatever he's doing wherever he's going. Remember, from the disciples' point of view, this is an unplanned encounter, at least from their perspective. But actually, from Jesus' perspective, they were his appointment for the day. And Jesus cancels the rest of the day, and he says, come, let's go to where I'm staying, and I'll give you my undivided attention. Look at verse 39. So they came, and they saw where he was staying, <clears throat> and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And as I said, if that's Roman time, that means it was ten o'clock in the morning. If it was Jewish time, it means it was four o'clock in the afternoon. It doesn't really matter. They stayed with him that day. It means they stayed with him the rest of the day. They either stayed with him for 14 hours from 10 in the morning till midnight, or they stayed with him for eight hours from four o'clock in the afternoon until midnight. It doesn't really matter. Whatever it was, they stayed with him for a long time until they got all of their questions answered. What were they doing? They're bombarding him with questions, and they're listening to his answers, and they're getting a Bible study unlike anything they ever got all of their lives growing up in the synagogue. After the resurrection, interestingly enough, Jesus gave a Bible study to two of the disciples. In Luke chapter 24, verse 27, here's what it says. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. He showed them his identity embedded way back in the Old Testament in Luke chapter 24. And then later on, that same night in Luke chapter 24, in verse 44, it says he gave the same Bible study to all of the disciples, not just the two. Here's what it says. He said everything written about me in the law and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled, and he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. That's exactly what he's doing in the house on that first day with these first two disciples. He's telling them and he's showing them who he is right from the Old Testament scriptures. So how effective was that first Bible study? Well, look at verse 40. One of the two disciples who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Look at verse 41. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. 
Andrew didn't say that when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Andrew didn't say, Wow, there's the Messiah. He didn't know who he was. He just heard John the Baptist's testimony. Then he followed Jesus. Then he spends this extended time of Bible study in the presence of Jesus. And he comes out and he goes to his brother. And now he's absolutely convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. That's eyewitness number two. There's the testimony of John's second eyewitness who saw, who heard, who experienced the person of Jesus Christ up close and personal and he gives testimony that he is indeed the Messiah. No question about it. If you wonder about how much Andrew really believed that, well, Andrew was willing to die for that testimony. He's the promised Old Testament Messiah. See, when Andrew first went to Jesus and said, where are you staying? We need to talk to you. He didn't know who Jesus was. All he knew was that John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God. But now after this all day Bible study at the feet of Jesus, examining, investigating, exploring, testing, he testifies that we have found the Messiah. So now John has served up two eyewitnesses, John the Baptist and Andrew. John the Baptist called him the Lamb. Andrew called him the Messiah. Now, you could throw some other eyewitnesses into the frame at this point. Look at verse 42. <clears throat> he brought his brother to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So in this first meeting with Peter, Jesus prophesies that Peter is going to go through a name change. And he's going to go through a character change. And that's exactly what happened to Peter. And we know that Peter testifies that Jesus is the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So now you have John the Baptist testifying that he's the Lamb. Andrew testifies that he's the Messiah. And Peter testifies that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So now there's three eyewitnesses. John the Baptist, Andrew, and Peter. Now there's something else here. Notice that John says in verse 41, Andrew first found his own brother Simon. First. What does the first mean? Well, that means... That Andrew either first found his brother Peter, then went on to find somebody else after he found Peter. Or it means that first Andrew went to find his own brother Peter, and second, the second disciple went to find his brother. Which would mean John, the apostle, the author, went to find his brother James. Now, which is the more likely scenario? Well, if you go over to Matthew chapter 4, you find Jesus walking along the beach, and he comes across those first four disciples. Andrew, Peter, James, and John. And so it would seem like that it's John who goes to get his brother, James. And so we have in this first little group of eyewitnesses, Andrew, Peter, John, himself, the author of the book, and probably James. Four ordinary men, fishermen, all testify that after an extended period of investigation, we have found the Messiah, we have found the Lamb, we have found the Christ, the Son of the living God. Keep in mind, all of these guys died for their testimony. So you throw in John the Baptist, that's five eyewitnesses so far. Now John's not done yet in chapter 1. We've still got a few more verses. He's got two more witnesses to add to the collection. There's a total of seven in chapter 1. And we'll pick those up next week. Seven witnesses. How much more evidence does a person need Seven eyewitnesses who, in the words of 1 John chapter 1, we testify to that which we have seen, that which we have heard, and that which we have experienced, we have touched with our hands. They're all saying the same thing. 
Seven of them. At some point, the issue is no longer, is this true? But rather, how can this not be true? I mean, why would John make this up? Why would these men lie? Why would these men be willing to go on record testifying to such outrageous claims that he's the fulfillment of the Passover lamb? He's the Messiah. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you're going to hear more testimonies from the last two fellows next week. Why would they be willing to testify to that and be willing to die? Peter was crucified upside down. Why would they be willing to do that if in fact it's all a lie? Why would they engage in such conspiracy, such deception, such cover-up? It takes more faith to believe that this is a myth than to accept the plain, simple, straightforward account of the four gospel writers. Father, thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture. Such a simple narrative, yet so compelling. Seven testimonies from seven men who all testify after an extended investigation that Jesus was the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And their confidence that they were right took them all the way to their death. Father, may their testimony strengthen our faith in the name of our precious Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.